All right. Welcome, everyone, um, to this uh, sort of uh, episode in the uh, PyMCCon web series. Um, so for those of you uh, who uh, are not already aware, um, this web series is a, a series of events that are led by members of the PyMC community. That is you. Uh, as part of this series, uh, community members um, are allowed to kind of participate and tell the rest of the community about cool tricks, best practices, general knowledge, and methods with the wider community. Um, a sort of critical feature, and in fact, my favorite feature of, of the series, uh, is that these events uh, are very flexible in terms of uh, the formats that the uh, individual events can take on, um, as we will uh, talk about in, in just a moment. Um, we have a, a rolling submission uh, system. So you, if you are interested in presenting and uh, being a, a sort of a lead on an event, um, you can submit at any time. Um, details are on the website, uh, which I will link to uh, in just a moment. Um, this weekend, uh, we are going to dive into the pile of submissions that we have received over the past uh, couple of months or so, um, and we are going to um, put those out to reviewers so that we can select the next batch of uh, presenters and events um, for the series. So there is still time uh, to get yours in, uh, and so if you have something cool that you want to tell the rest of the PyMC community about, um, yeah, there is still time, and I would encourage you to do so. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, our uh, series sponsor, Mistplay, for sponsoring the series. Uh, rumor has it uh, that they are hiring, so uh, go and check them out. Um, if you think you or your company would be interested in sponsoring the web series, there is information uh, on the series website, which I will link to, um, or you can contact me or any of the other organizers uh, about, about sponsorships. Um, so I'm going to uh, briefly uh, introduce uh, Bill uh, and then talk about uh, his event. Um, so uh, Bill has a, a background in physics and statistics, degrees in fact, uh, and has been a working uh, data scientist since then. Uh, he is currently a principal data scientist at PyMC Labs, um, but uh, I and hopefully you by the end of this event uh, will just consider him to be sort of a, a general GP wizard, basically. So. Um, as a uh, part of uh, Bill's event, um, uh, as I mentioned, the event format is uh, very flexible. Um, so uh, this talk is part of uh, Bill's event, but uh, Bill will also be publishing as kind of a, a follow uh, on um, a starter notebook that includes um, Gaussian processes uh, of different flavors, sort of as code, um, as well as related processes such as um, beast blinds, uh, standard time series approaches, uh, et cetera. So that basically you can uh, go and play around with these different techniques to see the benefits of each sort of directly. Um, I think there's going to be uh, a sort of toy uh, data set that you can play around with if you don't have your own data. If you do have your own data, then you can apply those techniques to your data. Um, so uh, this, as the title um, will indicate in just a moment, uh, this event is focused on Hilbert space uh, Gaussian processes. Our previous uh, PyMC web series event uh, presented by Dan Fan um, presented about uh, multi-output Gaussian processes. So we have had kind of back-to-back -back Gaussian processes um, talks. Uh, and so uh, as a kind of special sort of follow on to cap off these, uh, the pair of events, we're going to be holding a special edition of our PyMC office hours that's going to be happening next week. Um, and this uh, edition is going to be specifically focused on Gaussian processes of all kinds, not just multi output and Hilbert space. Um, so uh, Bill is going to be there answering your questions. Dan uh, from the previous uh, series uh, event will be there uh, also answering questions. And then we're going to have as a special guest, we're going to have PyMC uh, benevolent dictator for life, uh, Chris Fonsbeck there as well. All three of these uh, individuals are experts in both uh, Gaussian processes and PyMC. And so if you have questions about Gaussian processes of any sort, uh, this is not an opportunity that you will want to miss. Details uh, and registration are on the meetup page which I will link to in just a moment. So um, the last thing uh, I want to mention is that um, this uh, webinar uh, has a Q&A, and so you may see sort of the ability to ask questions through Zoom itself. Um, we are going to specifically prioritize questions that are asked um, as posts on the discourse post that has already been created and has all the details for Bill's uh, event, including um, some background material on Gaussian processes. So I will uh, uh, dump that link into uh, the chat so you can sort of navigate your way there. 
as I said, we will prioritize questions uh, that are asked over there, mostly because it will keep a record of all those questions and all the answers. Um, but uh, yeah, if you uh, can't or, or don't want to find your way over there, we will uh, take questions over here as well, um, just giving some priority to the questions around discourse. So, all right. Um, without further ado, I will uh, hand things over to our speaker for today. Sure, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Christian, for, for introducing everything. Um, but yeah, like Christian said, um, my name is Bill. I'm a, at PyMC Labs, and um, today I'm gonna be talking about um, Hilbert space, Gaussian processes, and mostly focusing on their implementation in PyMC. Um, so <clears throat> yeah, um, or HSGPs for short. So yeah, most of this talk is gonna focus on, um, I'm gonna kind of start by introducing just sort of really briefly what Gaussian processes are, um, where they've sort of been useful, and how to kind of use them within um, within your within your model, um, which is something that's kind of currently kind of diff difficult to do. So, um, so yeah, just sort of I'm not going to sort of talk about like how well GPs work on different types of data or how well HSGPs work. Um, both of those things work work great, and there's definitely better better sources to to read about that. So, um, so yeah. So, what are GPs? Um, in short, um, GPs are prior distributions over functions. So, you put priors on random variables, priors on scalars. You can put priors on vectors, um, which is just you know a set of scalars, and then you can put priors over functions too. Um, so yeah, it's pretty. A lot of the times you're you're building a model, you have some function and you're not sure how to model it. So GPs are a, a good choice to start, start thinking about there. Um, and the way to think about modeling them is that data points that are close in terms of X will also be close in terms of Y. So what that means too, and, and close is, is a, if you know anything about GPs, close is quite a, a loaded word here where that's, that's sort of where all the action is, is what you're gonna define as close. So like in this picture here, you know, these two, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but two of the points that are close in X are also gonna be close in the Y direction. And that's, you know, kind of a pretty simple, simple sort of, um, you know, basis for how this, how this stuff works. So um, yeah, um, so they're pros. Um, GPs are, are flexible and, and versatile. So a lot, of, a lot of models are special cases of GPs already. You probably, you know, you've probably fit GPs all the time and not known it. <laughs> like just regular linear models or GPs, special cases, um, autoregressive models, um, some types of neural nets, um, lots of lots of different stuff. Um, and it's also easy to sort of construct different kernels and, and use those to to make sort of new, unique GP models too. Um, another nice thing about them is that they're they're a lot more interpretable. So a lot of the tools people use for modeling unknown functions are, you know. Um, things like polynomials or things like splines, where um, you know once you start using them, they're they're pretty straightforward things. But then you start having to answer other questions like how many you know spline knots should I use, or how many orders of the polynomial should I should I have, or you know where I want to sort of predict this is a little outside of the range of my data. And if you're using splines, that's or polynomials, that's that's difficult, so or not possible. <laughs> so, also, how do you know incorporate prior information, right? Like, you know, like you might think that oh, my function is very, very wiggly, right? So you could you could have a lot of spline basis functions, or you could say it's wiggly over here and not over here. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of things that sort of can can get tricky there. Whereas with GPs, a lot of that stuff is kind of simple. You're usually only putting priors on a couple coefficients or a couple couple parameters. Um, and then, yeah, the other big thing is uncertainty quantification. So um, GPs are sort of sometimes used as kind of an alternative to machine learning models and predictive scenarios where um, you don't have much data. So a lot of machine learning models will just overfit on smaller data sets. And that's where that's where GPs work really well. Um, in fact, GPs would work great on larger data sets if only they weren't so slow, which is their primary con. <laughs> So that's the major drawback with GPs. And you know, the main reason why I'm sort of talking about Hilbert space GPs, HSGPs today, is that they're they're just a lot faster. So 
um, what kind of applications are GPs useful in? So, um, you know, relevant more in statistics too is is like spatial modeling. So, you know, here's here's I have some pictures here of some kind of cool paper I saw when I was looking around for, you know, applications of spatial modeling, and they these these folks here were used a GP to to model um, like a species occupancy to make like a species occupancy model. So, you know, you observe some some species of bats at different locations, and then you use those observations to sort of infer their overall range. And so um, it's kind of kind of a cool application there. Um, and, you know, they have sort of a more complicated model that this, that this GP was sort of embedded in, it looked like, which is a neat application too. Um, another, another example, uh, you know, this, this was made, um, this picture was made by Luciano Paz, and he, he works at PyMC Labs too with me. Um, and he's got a great blog post on modeling spatial data using GPs and PyMC. Um, not HSGPs yet, because they're they're just just got that merged in the other day. So, <laughs> but but you may recognize this. This is like the Minnesota County's radon example, um, and it's it's used all the time in um, you know intro to Bayesian stuff. It's like a great example of like a multi-level model. Um, but he added a GP to sort of model the you know the correlation between nearby counties and and their sort of baseline radon level. So, and you can see that you know there's there definitely seems to be a pretty interesting pattern there. So, um, so it's kind of a nice a nice application of GPs there. And um, and even at, at labs too, a lot of our a lot of the work we do with clients, we we do end up sort of building GPs into into different pieces just because they're so um, just useful and, and versatile. Um, but yeah, check out that blog post if you wanna see more about that. I think he kind of even incorporated like the curvature in the earth and sort of modified the covariance function to account for that distance. And that's, it was super interesting. So, um, and then uh, another, another big application where GPs have sort of seen a lot of use is in um, something called Bayesian optimization. So if you're, if you're not familiar, um, it's, it's been around as a long, a long time and just sort of experimental design where you're sort of adaptively building an experiment where, um, you know, you might not know where you want to, like where you want to sample points next. And so you're sort of balancing finding the best location with where you haven't looked yet. Um, but it's seen a lot of popularity and a lot of use recently as a way of um, tuning your, your hyperparameters and machine learning models. So, you know, you may, you may, you know, be trying to decide how you're configuring your random forests or your ensembles, and you can, you know, instead of doing like a grid search tuning thing, you would, um, you know, use the, use Bayesian optimization and, um, you know, try changing the learning rate or however you're, you know, whatever you're optimizing for, and then seeing how well the model does during cross-validation and sort of keep going like that. Um, and you can see there's this acquisition function at the bottom and the GP is fitting this unknown function. So that's where the GP comes in. That would be like this, uh, this blue curve with the uncertainty. And so you're trying to um, balance where the maximum might be. So that's kind of over here with where there's a lot of uncertainty. So that's where you want to sample next over here. So that's like the new learning rate that you might you might try using. Um, so yeah, that's sort of been a good a good use for them. Um, and there's there's other things too besides string, tuning machine learning models, but that's sort of a definitely a common one because that's definitely a time consuming process. And having something sort of pick parameters in a smart way is very helpful. Um, and then the other one is they've they're very helpful in understanding some of the theory behind neural networks there's interesting connections between gaussian processes and neural networks the sort of the original one was a infinitely wide neural network with sort of untrained yet with just gaussian like noise for the weights is equivalent to like an infinitely wide neural network like that is equivalent to a gaussian process which is an interesting result and then there's been something about like a neural tangent kernel lately that that relates sort of deeper, deep, deep learning neural networks to GPs. And um, it's kind of hard to do math on, you know, thinking about neural network stuff, but if you can kind of show that, 
what you have is equivalent to some sort of kernel and then think of it in terms of a Gaussian process like that, then there's a lot of math there that you can sort of use to, to show different things about your, your neural network models. Um, and then, so this is where I, I'm mostly interested in them and um, where I think it's kind of, it's been hard to use them and what this, this talk is sort of mostly focused on is using GPs as just pieces within some larger probabilistic model you might be building. Um, on the right here, I've got logos, logos from different, different things like PyMC or Stan or NumPyro or bugs. And, um, you know, you might like, like the radon example, um, you might be, you know, mostly interested in predicting radon, but you also have like the floor level and you want to do like a fully Bayesian model. So you still need a, you know, a GP to sort of fit in there to model the spatial effect, or you may have a term in your model and you're not sure if it's linear, um, or maybe it kind of goes up and goes down and back up again. And, you know, it, instead of sort of, you know, making these decisions about what exactly should be the shape of the curve that I want to fit, or like I said before, maybe you don't want to start getting into splines and polynomials. It can be, you know, it can be easy or it should be easy, <laughs> I think, to, to just use a GP. It's sort of natural a lot of the time. But the problem is, is that once you start working with GPs, you know, it's, you, you kind of uncover a lot of other difficulties because you may not want to start using GPs as components in your model because GPs are, are very slow. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's sort of the main thing. They're, they're slow and then they can be complicated. So the second line here where there's lots of, there are a lot of fast, you know, faster GP approximations and implementations out there. Um, but it's, it's definitely difficult to sort of know your way around and know when to use them and when they work. And then you'd have to, um, you know, actually code them up potentially. And usually it's just sort of not, um, maybe not worth the, not worth the trouble. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's, it's challenging both to like overcome the speed issue to, to decide that, well, this model I was fitting was taking a minute or two, and then I'm going to add a whole lot of time to that if I want to start introducing GPs or, you know, try and really dig into what these different approximations and, and, and whatnot are. So, um, yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot of different types of approximations and implementations, and they all kind of apply in special cases and work well in certain scenarios. Um, you know, a lot of them, yeah, so some of them are structure based. So, like, you know, are your input X points sort of one dimensional or are they equally spaced? Um, do your X points lie on, on a grid? That's another one. Um, are you only maybe worried about changes that happen over very short length scales or very long, um, or, you know, very short distances or very long distances relative to the X in your data? Um, and, and kind of a big one too, is are you using pretty specific kernel or covariance functions? Um, yeah, I see a lot of raised hands. How do I, um, do I, <laughs> okay, it's just, yeah. So um, yeah, so that's, um, those are sort of the, the sort of the difficulties you have to deal with there. Um, so let's see, then a lot of the, there's a lot of great GP software out there too where, um, but the, the problem is, is that it can be hard to sort of work them into, um, into, in, into your model. Um, they're sort of built for sort of like, when you're trying to make like a GP model, like I'm just gonna use a certain type of GP to sort of make this model. Um, I'm not necessarily doing MCMC. Um, I'm mostly just interested in something like prediction. That's, that's sort of where, you know, I'm I'm generalizing a lot here, but <laughs> that's where these other other software packages like GP Flow or GPy Torch or um, you know the stuff in Scikit Learn. That's sort of what the 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 main usefulness for it for it there is. Um, there's a summary on this this Wikipedia link down here, um, and and a, and a lot of these you can apply within some some of them you can apply within probabilistic models, but also too, the implementations aren't super easy to write. <laughs> it's not like 
um, you can just sort of whip it up really quickly. Some of them you can, some of them you can't. Um, but so yeah, then what, why I wanted to talk about this was that the HSGP approximation does, it seems like it solves a good amount of these problems. Um, I've been using it at work for, gosh, almost a, almost a year now. And, and, you know, and it's, it's been really effective <laughs> for this, this sort of thing. It's been easy to just, just throw it in if, if I want to, you know, model some factors is maybe nonlinear, but I know, don't quite know how, or, um, and yeah, and it, it's, it doesn't solve every problem, but it does, it does help a lot. Um, so here's the two kind of papers where you can read more about the method. Um, the one on the left is the kind of the original one. And then the one on the right is where, and it's kind of where I got wind of it is um, sort of how, why it's about like why it works so well in a probabilistic programming context like STAN or PyMC and just sort of applying it in that, in that context and, and showing how, how it works. Um, so what it is fundamentally is you, it's a, it's an approximation on the GP prior. So you, you model the G, so you have a GP on your left, right? And you have some unknown function F, you are gonna put a, a prior on it. That's a Gaussian process, has mean zero, some covariance function K, um, the covariance function or kernel is a function of the inputs X and some, some other kernel hyperparameters that you don't know, like the length scale L or, or others. And what it is, it's an approximation that turns this into a, a linear model. So F is now approximated as a function. So linear model, just in the same, it's the same form as splines or polynomials or something like that. So the basis functions now depend only on X and the coefficients beta depend only on the GP kernel hyperparameters here denoted L. Um, and it's, it's kind of, it's nice because when you're, when you code this up in, in, uh, your model, you're only doing, um, you know, you're only doing matrix multiplication now. Um, so the computational cost reduces from order n cubed because normally with GPs on the left, you have to do, um, the Cholesky factorizations. That's where that cubic term comes from. And on the right, you're just doing matrix multiplication. So now it's order of n, m plus m uh, per log density evaluation. So m then is the number of basis functions that you'd have in phi. So it's like the number of columns phi, it's equivalent to like the number of splines you might be using or the number order of the polynomial. So that's, that's sort of why this is so useful and also why it's really versatile. Um, so, it, it's not like a, it works all the time. Um, it just works in a lot of pretty, pretty common cases. Um, oh, I should actually, before we move on, um, are there any questions I could answer at this point? Or this might be a good time to, to ask about that. Looks like we're uh, good on questions for right now. Just as a reminder <clears throat> to uh, attendees, uh, I have the link to the discourse post and um, we're going to prioritize questions there. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Cool. Um, yeah. So the rest of the talk then is going to be more about using HSGPs in your model and how that kind of works. And more specifically about the implementation in, in PyMC, which um, I tried to make, you know, make it, make it easy to do a lot of these things that I'd been wanting to do. So, um, so it doesn't work all the time. So when, when you'd want to think about using HSGPs in your model is, um, so, you know, say you've already decided that a GP is a good idea. Um, so given that, um, you're, if you're using a probabilistic programming language, uh, like PyMC or Stan or NumPyro or something, and you kind of plan on relying on MCMC, um, it's, you can, you can also fit this with, um, uh, variational inference like ADVI, um, that's also another good way to scale this up, but um, ADVI comes with its own own set of issues. But if you're doing MCMC, that's sort of the main the main thing. Um, and then the the biggest restriction is probably the dimension of your inputs is you know from one to maybe maybe three or maybe four. Um, it's and by dimension of the inputs, I mean your your x. So you know time is one dimensional. Spatial would be like two dimensional. 
spatiotemporal, so that's kind of over space and time at the same time would be like three. So um, those those are the sorts of that's sort of what that means. So it's it's it doesn't work. It doesn't scale very well at all to higher dimensions, just because it's it's similar to when you do like a tensor product with splines. Um, you you know if you have you know ten you know ten basis vectors for one dimension and ten for the other. It's when you do both at the same time, it's 10 times 10 for 100. So they just sort of multiply each other like that. And HSGPs do the same thing. Um, the other big restriction is you have to be using, this one's kind of the more technical one. So you have to be using a covariance or kernel that you can characterize by a power spectral density. Um, the common ones that people use all the time, like exponentiated quadratic and matern are okay. And they're, and they're also built into pi MC. So, you kind of, you know, in practice, you sort of don't need to worry about that other than checking that it's it exists. <laughs> um, and just to say too, um, you can, one way to um, define a kernel is through just how it operates on the inputs X and define sort of the similarity or the distance between the X's. And then the other way is through the power spectral density. So you can basically take the Fourier transform of that. Um, and that's that's what, that's just another way to characterize it. And so the Hilbert space GPs work with that power spectral density function. Um, so here's some other implementations that are that are out there that I these, this is what I'm aware of. There there definitely may be more, um, but this was at least what I could think of when I was putting this together. Um, it's a pretty new method, so it's not all over the place, but um, most of them are in Stan. So this first link here goes to the paper that that I linked that I showed earlier on. Um, this one on the right with Ruitort, Mayall et al. Um, that's sort of the, the code to produce the paper. Then these two are the, these two case studies are by Aki Vitari, and they're really nice examples of how to, how to, how to, how to build models on, on, on this sort of data and how to sort of think about constructing them um, from the ground up. And they, they use HSGPs and talk about that. Um, and, and sort of show how that works. And then also VRMS, uh, which is sort of like a, a higher level language overstand for making mixed models, um, mixed effects models. They, they also have a way to do um, HSGPs. And um, also NumPyro has an example where they're using the same birthday data set. That's, that's this one I've got on the right. You can see that there's a lot of data points here and if you if you try and fit it with a with a regular GP without approximations, it probably won't won't fit on your in your RAM. And I've tried, and it doesn't. It's very difficult. Well, it doesn't happen. So <laughs> um, you sort of have to resort to approximations for that. And these two examples sort of show you how to do that. Um, then the implementation that we just sort of just finished, and it should be in the next release of PyMC, um, is is what I'm going to talk more about after this. And then. Also, uh, Tomas Capretto has been incorporating it into Bambi. So I think that that should be out there soon too. And Bambi is Bambi's sort of the equivalent in PyMC to BRMS. So for making linear mixed models. Um, so yeah, um, this is how you would write a GP in PyMC right now, just sort of a basic one. Um, you have your, you know, your with context that you're familiar with. So I'm sort of, yeah, I'm kind of aiming this talk at sort of users of PyMC too. So this, some of this stuff is probably pr pretty familiar to you, but um, uh, you have your, your model context and then you, you set your priors on the hyperparameters for the GP. So eta is what scales it. Basically it controls how up and down, how tall your functions go. And then um, L is the length scale. So that's sort of like how wiggly they are. If L is large, then those are slowly varying functions here. And if L is small, then those are things that vary very quickly. Um, this, this little function here is really handy for setting priors on the length scale. You basically just say, I want the parameters that would give me an inverse gamma just prior with a lower bound at five, an upper bound at a thousand, and um, I didn't show it, but it's 95% of the, of the prior mass is between this range. And you just have to give it a guess on the two parameters, alpha and beta. And then you can just drop that into your prior length scale. Um, so you can see here that, you know, you just, then you construct the covariance function by 
you scale it with ADA and then you include the length scale. And then um, here's your GP object and that's here and you pass in the covariance and your actual GP is given then later where you do GP.prior, you pass in your data and here I'm just, you know, year. So this is like a 1D example over time um, is what this would be. So all you need to do then with HSGPs in PyMC is just change this line. So um, it's just a, so there's a few ways to use the API. And the first way is just as a drop in replacement. So if you're using regular GPs in your code, it's just a one line change to try out HSGPs. And so long as it's low dimensional, um, you probably can just get a huge speed up <laughs> right off the bat. You also have to specify M and C. So I'll talk more about this in like the later office hours thing or like with the case study notebook that is like the next, the next, uh, the next thing on the agenda, but um, yeah, but basically M is like the number of basis vectors. So the number of polynomials, the number of spline knots, it's kind of equivalent to that. The, the higher M you go, the better your approximation is. Um, and then, but also the slower it runs. And then C is like uh, kind of the factor that controls the boundary of how, of where your approximation is, is accurate. So um, a smaller C, you don't wanna go below about 1.2 it doesn't really work and you can go higher, but you know, if you have, I can get into it more, but usually C's around 1.5 to 1.2. Those are sort of usually okay, but there's a, there's a sort of way to choose M and C that depend on how you're setting your prior, like which, you know, it, they apply for certain length scales, but that's sort of the only decision making you have to do. But otherwise it's very easy to just sort of update your code. And also, you know, I kind of, fussed over setting these, but it's it's kind of robust. If you just put a large number in here and a number like that here, it's probably gonna work fine. <laughs> so um, yeah, so the the sort of the, the four things that are sort of easy about it are, or the, the, the four things about HSGPs in PyMC that make it particularly easy to use that I sort of wanna talk about are the first thing is that it's easy to change the number of input dimensions. So in some of the other implementations I've experimented with, they, they're sort of only made for 1D or multiple dimensions. So if you sort of want to switch between one or the other, there's sort of a lot of code you have to change. Um, in PyMC, you just change the input dimension like you would for any other GP, and it's quite simple. Um, the other one is additive covariances, but where you keep the same number of unknown parameters. So you might know that the sum of two GPs is also a GP. And you also might know then that that's equivalent to one, G one GP where you've just summed the covariances. So, you know, in it's, it's usually more computationally efficient to sum the covariances and then sample instead of having two like totally separate GPs because that just sort of doubles the number of unknown parameters in your model. That's not always a bad thing, but um, you know, it just, it just makes things a little quicker. Um, so you, but basically you can add covariances. Um, another thing you can do is it's pretty easy to define your own kernel and just write in the power spectral density function. So you can write your HSGPs over, you know, whichever, whichever, uh, <laughs> whichever interesting, interesting kernel you want to try, so long as you can write down its power spectral density. Um, and then the most important one is you can return the basis and the coefficients in this kind of linearized form. So in the same form as a linear model with like your, you know, design matrix X and your, you know, unknown parameters beta. Um, and what this does, is it helps you, you can kind of efficiently build multi GP models on your own by reusing the basis vectors. And then, you know, instead of having the coefficients be a vector, you can have them be a matrix and and that works just as fine too. Um, the other benefit here is that if, if by chance you've used GPs before, um, making predictions with them can kind of be, it's, it's whole kind of, it's a whole its own can of worms basically. Um, a, a lot of GP approximations too, the, the predictions are, are kind of a, a bit of an afterthought <laughs> usually, and they might be quite slow. So, 
you fit your model on some data and then you have to predict on like a large amount of data, you might be unpleasantly surprised at how, how difficult that is. <laughs> um, but that's not the case here. Um, and the other, the other difficulty too, is that the code to write the predictions might be a little, um, you know, it's, it's sort of its own thing too. It's not straightforward to write the code to make the predictions, but um, the way it's implemented in PyMC, all you need to do is just mutate the input data like you would if you were working with a linear model. Um, so that's just uh, PM.setData and I'll show what that looks like in a sec. Bill, there's a question, and, and then you oh, might get sure. to this, so you can sort of defer if it's more appropriate sort of later. There's a question about the difference between the set data um, kind of approach and the conditional method um, available for GPs and PyMC. Yeah, so the the reason, yeah, exactly. So the I actually won't show it too much later, so it's a good time to, to talk about it. So right now, the, the GP model uses this stock conditional um, approach to do predictions, basically because um, you're, you're modeling your data as one big GP and it's a function, right? So when you have new data, you sort of need a new distribution to represent the, you know, the distributions over that function. And so that's what PM dot, or GP dot conditional does is it, it actually makes that new distribution using, you know, the result you learn from the model. Um, you can't just sort of just the way GPs work, you sort of can't just drop in like like you would for a linear model, just change out X and change your X variables and then just run it again um, because of that. Um, you can, but so yeah, but because HSGPs are a linear model and that they, you know, they have this form on the right here, then then that's why you can use PM.setData to do predictions with HSGPs. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, even in small data cases, I would probably just use HSGP, like, you know, somewhere where I don't need an approximation and a full a full GP is okay. Just the fact that you can, you know, do predictions like you would for the rest of your model is, is probably enough of a, a reason for me to use this. <laughs> um, because, yeah, I mean, doing the predictions in something like standard PyMC can sometimes be it's, it's, you know, you've, you thought you did a lot of work getting your model fitted and then you sort of have quite a bit more to do <laughs> to get the uh, the predictions working the way you want or, you know, or cross validation and all of that. So sometimes it's simple, sometimes it's not. So this, this set data thing goes a long way to making it a little more straightforward. Um, does that kind of answer the question? I mean, I don't know if I, I can't tell, but. I think that, uh... I mean, that makes sense to me. Um, okay, as, sure. as with all these questions, you know, follow-ups uh, can obviously be uh, sort of offlined on uh, discourse, which is right. why we prefer having questions up there. So thanks. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool. Yeah, and I'll, I'll take a look at that after the talk and see if I can answer anything, answer anything there. So uh, yeah, and then, um, okay. So the, the rest of the thing, I'm just going to step through these, these four points and just sort of show you what that code looks like. So, um, so this looks, this should look exactly the same as before. There's just a few couple, couple differences. So um, your maternal covariance function, this two here is here now, it used to be a one. <laughs> this specifies the number of input dimensions that the covariance is gonna operate over. And then M is now 60 comma 60, whereas it used to be like, I don't know, 200 or something, I forget. Um, and that's that's it. That's all you sort of needed to do to uh, to, yeah, have a model over, say, you know, a spatial model, right? This is what you could use for that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of all there is to it. Not much to say, <laughs> which is nice because, um, you know, experimenting with, you know, maybe you want to have a GP in one direction in X and then another in Y, and then you kind of maybe want to try out an interaction. This is sort of like the GP version of adding interactions to your model too. You can, you can do that also, so. Yeah, and then here's here's just some samples that I made because, you know, having having code and slides is boring and pictures are better. So, this is these are some samples from that, just this GP prior F. So, or from the HSGP. So you can see, yes, it's it's working. <laughs> these are sort of cool pictures of a two D matern with three halves, you know, 
process with that prior. So, and and whatever the length scale and, and eta hyperparameters are up here too. That's kind of part of this little forward simulation. So um, yeah, and then the next one, this one's interesting too, I think. So this is additive covariances, but it keeps the number of unknown parameters constant. So this is kind of a, you know, I don't know about this, you know, how useful this particular example might be, but, you know, say you have, uh, a process that you want to think of as a sum of two Gaussian processes. Um, say this one is a matern 3-2 process that has a short length scale. See how I've bounded this between 5 and 15. Um, and then you have another process that's maybe smoother. So you want to say it's exponentially quadratic and it operates over much slower sort of time scale or slower scale. So you bound the length scale or you know bound the prior roughly between 15 and 150. Um, after, yeah, I mentioned Alex and Dora and Ricardo and I think Michael worked on this fine constraint prior. I use this all the time for working with GPs. It's very handy. <laughs> I think um, Michael Betancourt talked about that and it's like right, right up blog post about GPs. So just to just to cite everybody, this is very handy, but <laughs> but yeah, it's sort of built into Pi and C and you just set it like that. Um, and, and this is sort of what samples from this prior look like. So um, so yeah, oh yeah, so sorry, stepping back one second. So to add the covariance functions, you just add them like this and then pass it in to your HSGP. Um, and, and if you check beta, this hidden parameter, this is the number of, um, you know, the number of unknown coefficients is gonna tell you it's, it's 60 by 60, just like it would be if you thumbed two different GPs. So again, this is equivalent to like, you know, GP1 plus GP2, you know, um, this F is, and then you'd add them, is also equivalent to like adding the covariance functions into one GP. So, and you can see that in the in the prior samples, like these two on the left um, are where probably this eta for the slow exponential quadratic happened to be large. And this one was kind of sampled to be small. Um, and where here it was sort of maybe the other way around, or maybe this is a mixture because you can kind of see the slow change and then the little, the little short, you know, matern sort of jagged sort of changes happening there. So, um, yeah. Then so the third thing. I, we just oh, have uh, another sure. question yeah. again. If, Go for it. If it's more appropriate to kind of defer, I feel free. Mikhail uh, asks, can I sample one function from the posterior? And then deterministically evaluate that function on a, on new x. Um, you can sample one function from the posterior. Um, I don't know how to what you mean by um, determinist like evaluate it on that one function on a new x. Like condition the new GP on that one sample. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't quite follow. So maybe it, maybe if you ask it in the discourse, I can, uh, he, I can look he follows after up, and think about it. <laughs> he, he followed up to to say, uh, to run an optimizer on that function. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. I still don't know. I, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> I'll get back to you. Um, but yeah, maybe. Um, I think if you can do it with GPs, you could do it with this. I think I can. I think I'm I'm on pretty solid ground in saying that. So, um, yeah. And then, um, uh, yeah. So this the the third thing is if you wanted to have something that you know, do you find your own power spectral density? I haven't tried it out, but I'm kind of curious to do it. Is that spectral mixture kernel with HSGPs just to see, since that's one's kind of uh, a, a sort of one that's been written about a lot that is defined as a power spectral density. So, but anyway, um, yeah, like here's an example of just how the exponentially quadratic is implemented in Pi and C. And you don't even need to add this full method, which is just how you would calculate it over X. You just need to add um, a power spectral density method over omega and it'll just work. And that's all you need to do. So, um, yeah, so not. Pretty easy, but the common ones are implemented. So um, I think it's just exponential, exponential quadratic, matern five two, matern three two um, are already there. And honestly, that's mostly what you use anyway if you're sort of making simple pieces in, in larger models anyway. So 
And the, the next thing, the most important thing is I think you can, it also lets you return the basis and the coefficients in uh, this linearized form. And this is also, I'll show later too, how this, this is the way it works when you're doing PM.set data to make predictions. So, um, so you set up your HSGP, you use L instead of C. That's kind of important because you need it to not depend on X. And um, normally the GP will sort of build L out of C and X. But if you just pass an L, L just means like you rescale your data to be mean centered. So this one goes from zero to 10, drop the mean or subtract the mean. And now it's from negative five to five. So saying L is 10, that means that uh, it's like the boundary of where the GP approximation is accurate. So it's going to be accurate from X values, you know, scaled X values with mean subtracted from negative 10 to 10. That's what that means. Um, so yeah, you, so you have your mean here, you subtract it after you make the data mutable. So that way, when you set it, it'll get the right mean subtracted. But this is something you'd have to do with like any other model too. Um, and then you can call gp.prior linearized. So you made it here. And instead of calling gp.prior, you call prior linearized. And it returns phi, the basis vectors, and the square root of the power spectral density. Um, you make your coefficients beta. Um, m star is just the product of m. So m star here is equal to 200. So if you had a 2D GP where it was 60 and 60, m star would be 60 times 60. So pretty straightforward there, too. And yeah, and then this is your GP. So why this is particularly useful is that it may, you know, first you can use PM.set data to do the predictions. And it also may be easier in this form to incorporate a GP into a larger linear model or part of the model's linear, part of it's not. You, you basically have the pieces for a linear model as a GP, which is pretty handy. Um, and also if you want to have multiple GPs that sort of are working over the same X, it's easy to sort of just have beta be like a matrix sized. And then, you know, now you have, you know, multiple, multiple GPs with the same dimension that can all kind of work independently and model, model things sort of separately, which is sort of another, another handy use case. I think Dan in the last, in the last talk talked about multi output GPs, but this would be a simpler case of that. That was a little more, more sophisticated, but, but yeah, just for the basic thing, you can use this um, and, and do that. Um, so what this looks like then, so I know we're getting, getting near the end, but there's just a couple slides left. So the first five columns of the basis phi look like this. Um, they're really just sine waves. Um, if you increase the number of basis vectors, you're adding more of these sine waves or technically eigenvectors of Lilliputian at higher and higher frequencies. So maybe a light bulb goes off with the connection of why power spectral densities are how you characterize this. <laughs> um, that's sort of the intuition there. Um, and here's what the, you know, the PSD. So that's what, you know, this squared. So it's just the power spectral density sort of looks like. I plotted it for a few, whoops, a few different values of the length scale and for two different covariances. So you can see here when the length scale is long, there's more energy at lower frequencies. So that's like less wiggly, slowly varying functions. When the length scale is small, like 0.1, this, this gets flattened out and there's lots more energy up here. So that's that's it like quickly changing high frequency stuff and omega is like the frequency. So, um, and you can see that, you know, matern and exponential quadratic are pretty similar, but a little different in how they sort of behave at, in the middle and at the, at the tails of higher frequency stuff, so. You can see that Matern has just slightly higher, higher, you know, powers at higher um, frequency stuff, and that's kind of why they're rougher looking. So, um, then, so this is how this this code on the left is the same as what I showed two slides ago, and on the right, this is how you do predictions. You just set your data. Um, say your new data is from zero to fifteen. You set your data. Um, it's going to go through here. It's going to get mean subtracted. And when you call sample posterior predictive, you'll, your, you know, F is going to have your predictions now. And it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward, just as straightforward as it is to make predictions with any other part of a PyMC model. So, um, yeah, I, I found this super useful and I hope, I hope other people do too. Um, and that's kind of the, 
I know I kind of went by quickly, but it's just a couple lines of code and it's quite short to do predictions. Um, and yeah, it's it's fast too. That was another thing I got to emphasize is it's just a linear model. So if making predictions with, you know, a spline model or interpolations is fast, then it's going to be just as fast for this. So, um, so yeah, here's my last slide. So in conclusion, um, GPs are useful for lots of things, but usually when people say that it's kind of abstract because <laughs> they're usually a little too slow or it's just kind of too complicated to want to start dealing with when you're, when you're working. Um, and, you know, and it's a blessing and a curse that there's many, many fast approximations out there, but that they only work in specific situations. And it's, um, it's, you know, it's a lot of work to kind of find your way through all of these and try things out and, you know, wait while your computer fan runs very loudly for a long time. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so, but HSGPs kind of go a long way uh, to helping that out. There's other, they're sort of not the only approximation that would be useful in this context, but I think they're useful a lot. So um, they're fast and flexible and easy to work with, at least uh, uh, so that's what I found. Um, you can change the input dimensions, you can add them, and um, it's easy to make predictions. And it's also easy to, you know, show it as a linear model and combine it into your larger model overall. Um, and I also want to mention that there's two G, two GP products for Pi MC and Google Summer of Code. Um, you know, you can propose something else, but it's focusing. There's two of them focusing on improving spatial modeling and fast exact GPs. Um, the next event. Oh yeah, and the, so you might have noticed there wasn't any data or case studies here. Um, I think the next thing I'm going to put together a notebook that's kind of a case study that shows HSGP on some data versus maybe regular GPs or splines and um, kind of been playing around with that like cherry blossom data that's on the cover of uh, Mikhail Rass statistical rethinking, um, just as an example. So, but um, that'll be more about kind of the specifics. So setting priors for GPs and how to set L, C or M. So sort of the, the parameters that control the approximation or yeah, or bring your own data like Christian said earlier. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's all. Um, any any questions folks may have? Awesome. So I want to um, just uh, thank you. We will turn to questions uh, in, in just a second. But um, to reiterate um, what uh, Bill just said, we are having office hours. Uh, so come ask all of your questions about uh, GPs, not just uh, HSGPs, but really GPs of any flavor. We will have uh, three, count them, three uh, GP experts. IMC experts to answer all of those questions. So that is uh, next week. Uh, it is the 22nd or uh, depending on your time zone, the morning of the 23rd. So all of the uh, details so you can figure out um, what time it is for you locally uh, are on the meetup page. You can register there. Uh, all the Zoom information, everything is there as well. So um, yeah, so looking forward to that. The notebooks will be posted to the same discourse uh, post where we have been uh, directing you to ask questions for today's talk. So. Uh, all right, so I see uh, questions um, rolling in, and I will uh, try and uh, feed you some. Let's see what's happening over here. Awesome. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> couple a uh, couple questions over from from discourse. So, um, do you have, and maybe it would be part of uh, the notebook that you're that you're going to be um, posting um, benchmarks comparing uh, GPs and sort of vanilla. I'm assuming uh, GPs and HSGPs, um, and I'm not sure sort of what dimensions you would benchmark them, but yeah, availability mm -hmm. of that. I probably won't do that. Um, but if you're interested in that, I would check this paper on the right. This is where lots of those benchmarks are done. Um, practical Hilbert space, approximate Bayesian, blah, blah, that one. <laughs> that would be the one to check. Um, I will say though, that it will be quite obvious. It's for me, how it's been has been it goes from not happening to happening. It goes from hours to minutes and then minutes to seconds has sort of been my experience with this speed up. <laughs> That's so, you know, it may be different for you, but it's, uh, I haven't felt it was like close enough to bother timing. <laughs> it's, it's much faster. It's great. So it, yeah. it passes the eyeball test. It does. It does. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, a couple of questions. Um, how fast is it to generate the basis set given X and kernel hyperparameters? Uh, pretty fast, yeah. Um, you, The code basically more or less just plugs X into 
Pi tensors, or you know, that's the Theano, whatever successor, Theano Asara successors sine function. I mean, it's pretty pretty straightforward. So yeah, um, I, I you know, it might be slow if you're generating like tons and tons of basis vectors, but then you're going to have to do MCMC sampling with them, and that's going to be the slow thing. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, follow up. Uh, so, if you want to optimize the hyperparameters, can you just optimize the marginal likelihood of the corresponding induced linear model, ignoring the GP? So, no, actually, um, that would be more of like a, a regular GP thing. Um, this particular approximation, it is just explicit. Like, um, I mean, if you wanted to integrate out, it's basically if you're looking at this equation on the right and you wanted to integrate out beta, right? I guess that's the equivalent. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't think you'd really do that. I think if you if you could do that, um, then you know that's assuming that you have a Gaussian likelihood and. Uh, you just you sort of don't have to worry about that stuff. That's sort of a speed up, actually. Um, yeah, there's if you're if you're not worried about speed, there's sort of no reason to marginalize out the GP. So, yeah, I guess that's how I'd answer that. Um, so uh, another question from from discourse, um, which I think kind of touches on something that uh, I had uh, as a question. Um, oh sure. So so you talked about um, the the two uh, covariance functions, and so this one specifically asked about the matern uh, covariance function. Um, so uh, so it asks whether sort of um, requiring. Uh, those two, or, or the question was about that one covariance function, um, could be seen as a limitation. Uh, I guess my broader question was kind of like, obviously, at the end, you know, you're sort of saying like it's all upside. Is there downside? Are there drawbacks? Um. Oh, so which part? These two, like adding them, is that sort of what the specific is? Or so I, th I think the question was just about sort of the the kind of requirement, quote unquote, of of the oh, okay. covariance the function. Um, is that is that limiting in any way? But I, um, I had just questions about. Yeah, I I don't think so. Also, this is this is sort of TBD, but there's a in the same paper they do um, a a very related um, like method for specifically for the periodic covariance too. That one actually doesn't. It seems like it would, but it doesn't have like a power spectral density that's in closed form. It's like an infinite series or something. So. Um, they have a version of H it's not quite HSTPs because the basis set's a little different, but it's a reduced rank approximation. So um, let's see, this is the wrong page, but um, um, but in practice, like I don't know, um, it's I mean it depends on what you're working on. <laughs> uh, I think usually for me, like it's usually simple covariances, not sort of like sums of kernels. I mean, you can do all of that stuff and some people do for some applications, but sort of your meat and potatoes day-to-day -day stuff, this is definitely like what you're probably sticking with. Um, and that's kind of why, yeah, that's why I think maybe that's a good way to sort of frame this HSGP is sort of your, you know, of, of all this, the C of GP approximations, if you're in a probabilistic programming language, this is probably your, your, your meat and potatoes one. <laughs> Maybe that's the way to, to frame it. So the go to. The go to, yeah. Try it first. If it's it probably the, the harder requirement is this dimension of the inputs being mm -hmm. small. That's probably the the most of the, the larger bummer, I think. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a question, and this might be just about sort of GPs in general. I'm not entirely sure. Mm -hmm. Um so can this approximation help to tackle time series problems where there are trend breaks in the data? Yeah, I think so because you may you may represent the trend breaks not using a kernel, and then you may have a GP sort of as that. So that's sort of your mean, and your GP is added onto that, and then I think that'd be a great application for this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I guess the, the one other question, uh, that was, uh, for me was, um, you illustrated kind of the, um, the relationship between the kind of, um, covariance uh, functions and the parameterizations and the sort of power spectrum. Um, and then you kind of showed how the X quad and the matern were like subtly different. 
Um, do you have guidance about when, under what circumstances yeah. to pick one of these or the other? Um, I think in my experience, usually if you're not sure, it's good to start. Well, I mean, if you, um, what's great about these covariances, they sort of represent sometimes kind of particular things. And so um, that's sort of like, if you are sure, you know what to pick. But if you're not sure, a good default to sort of pick is probably this Matern 5-2, I think. Um, a lot of people use this exponentially quadratic one, but it's actually very smooth. And so you're sort of adding this extra bit of prior that your functions that you're modeling are like very smooth. They're, they're infinitely differentiable, <laughs> actually. And, and often the thing you're modeling is just not that smooth. So um, this is usually a pretty solid first choice. To, to try out. But um, it's the kind of thing where you can just kind of plot your priors and see what they look like. Like, um, you know, like here's, in this example, you can see the matern 3, 2. So if you sort of look past the length scale change, um, you know, this one is sort of denom dominated by the exponentially quadratic. And you can see how smooth these blobs are. <laughs> and then here, this is like matern 3, 2, and they're kind of rougher, you know. Um, and the smoothness might be desirable, but it may not be. Um, you may kind of want to default for something that's a little bit, a little bit rougher. Um, it kind of depends. It also depends on how far in the future you want to sort of be forecasting if that's your goal, um, because something that's very rough is not going to forecast very far in the future, right? You sort of need some smoothness or periodicity or some sort of regularity to even make forecasts. So that may sort of make you, I don't know, want to look for things that have this sort of behavior. So yeah, it's kind of just, yeah, it's just how, what you think about your functions beforehand. But um, I, I think generally that, that exponential quadratic can be a bit too smooth sometimes. Sometimes you want that if it's just like a little term in your regression, that's just like, maybe it has a little wiggle in it and that's all, and then that's a good fit. But um, yeah, so it's lots of, lots of different ways to go there, so. And I guess if they're super fast, then this is one of those situations where maybe you, you can, can try, try them. them yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Sometimes yeah. trying everything with GPs normally is not yes. fun, but that yeah. <laughs> nice luxury. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, try them. All right. So I think that um, takes care of our questions, but I will uh, highlight uh, mostly for, for you, Bill. Um, there are many uh, people who are expressing a great interest in being able to play around with this and see the notebook that you, uh, you, cool. you described. Yeah. So um, yeah. just, just to remind everyone that notebook is will be posted um, to the discourse uh, thread uh, that I have linked to a couple of times where we have been taking questions. So um, and uh, as I mentioned briefly earlier, um, there are several resources uh, that Bill provided as kind of background. So mm -hmm. um, if you are kind of generally interested in the topic of uh, Gaussian processes, um, but want some kind of more foundational um, information, uh, there are resources linked in that same thread. So that is the clearinghouse. That is where all the information uh, associated with this event is is located. And uh, again, just to kind of reiterate, we're going to have office hours, special GP focused office hours, live Q and A with uh, yeah a whole whole set of GP and PyMC experts next week. Details are on Meetup. Uh, I will dump in links again in case you you missed those. So. So thank you very much, uh, Bill, uh, and I really yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, you. everyone who joined, too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Christian.